Way back in January, I did a far-fetched run and I posed a question to you guys. There are four Pokemon in Gen 1 that are normal and flying typing, and I wanted to know which one you thought would reign supreme on the tier list when it's all said and done. To my surprise, pretty much every bird got a comment, and the one conclusion I came to was that not many of you really respect the work that Farfetch put in during its run. Look at this little duck's tier card. It almost got an 89 on a scale to 100. It ranks higher than things like Snorlax and Starmie, and it's within a few points of great runs like Machamp, Needle King, and Zapdos, but runs, they're not played on paper. Maybe some of these other feathered friends can actually surprise us. Welcome back to the channel where I do Pokemon solo challenges, mainly focused on Generation 1 and 2, with the ultimate goal of ranking Pokemon based off of several runs with some refinements and optimizations. Now if you want to know the rules I do for these types of runs, they are in the description along with some other things, so check that out if you are interested. And if you are a returning subscriber like John Boyer, just sit back, grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and just know that I really do appreciate the support. But let's get down to brass tacks. I owe you guys some bird runs and we're gonna start with Pidgeot. This video will be broken into two segments. Starting out is gonna be that first attempt blind run. We'll go through it, we'll cover it, and after that I'm gonna show my best run. We'll talk about the changes and the time saves that ultimately leads to Pidgeot's rank. It's worth mentioning that I did the blind run live on stream for you guys a couple of months ago. It's unlisted now, but it is in the description if you really just want some more Pidgeot content. If you want that uncut, longer version, it's there. The opening rifle battle, it's simple, it usually is, but we get a glimpse at the starting moves. Gust and Quick Attack, they're 40 base power normal moves, and for this run specifically, there's virtually no difference between the two considering Pidgeot's base speed, so the advantage that Quick Attack has is nullified in that sense. And then we have Sand Attack. This move has, it's made many a runs, I can't even count how many runs it's made a nightmare, just because of the rival fight you already know, but just like Farfetch'd, our little pocket sand, it's going to be a very valuable asset today. Moving ahead, I have to say that Pidgeot felt pretty great to play. Oftentimes on a blind run, things can just feel very messy, and there's a lot of cleanup that you have to do during the next couple of playthroughs, but a lot of things here, they felt natural, and I got several things right the very first time through, starting right here in Viridian Forest. Pidgeot on paper looks like it's lacking several things that other birds have, mainly in the form of very powerful stab moves that it just doesn't get for whatever reason. But Pidgeot, my friends, it has one little trick up its sleeve, one little secret weapon. Pidgeot is in the medium slow leveling group, which for my money is the best outside of the fast leveling group, and all of the other birds, they're going to fall into the same medium fast group. This means that I can hit levels earlier, maybe I don't have to train as much, and hopefully that can save enough time to make this Route 1 bird remain competitive when it's all said and done. Now what this equates to in terms of just playing the game is that I can just go ahead, I can battle the three trainers in Viridian, and then we can move on to the Light Years Junior Trainer before Brock, and just this little bit of training alone gets me to level 12. Now considering that we only have resisted normal damage for red and blue version Brock, I did want to test out level 13, but at this point we are 153 experience away, so I do backtrack, I grind up that experience real quick, and that's going to lead me to my first attempt at the rock solid Pokemon trainer. Geodude is first, and we're going to see the true power of early game sand attack, and remember that Farfetch'd also utilized a similar strategy. There's a careful blend here, because on one hand, you can throw out a few sand attacks, you can make Geodude start to miss, it can keep you healthy, but on the other hand, it has defense curl, and it's going to make your resisted attacks only do a single point of damage. Pidgeot does boast a 17.5% chance to crit, but we don't really see it much here, and with 65, a whopping 65 power points of damaging moves, we can just comfortably chip away, not worry about power point usage, and we can just peck away at this little rock like it's a little bird seed on the ground. Next up is Onyx, and Pidgeot does have the speed to go first, which is always a plus because it means that we can control the bite damage, and overall we can control the flow of the fight. I start off with a couple of attacks of the sand variety, and from there, I'm only going to use sand attack when it goes for bide. By the time you have enough sand attack set up, you can see that I, I pretty much just attack through the earlier bides, and just like Geodude, you're just really slowly chipping away you're getting that bird seed and if sand attack does its job correctly you can just get through this one pretty comfortably and this is earlier than you might expect especially if you just don't know how strong evasion based moves like sand attack are so this one's done pretty clean
Moving ahead, a final stage Pokemon with some solid moves. It really doesn't face any difficulties early, but in the back of my mind, I was worried about Lieutenant Surge. So I just wanted to take full advantage of the medium slow leveling group. I wanted to get some quick levels here. You're going to see me take on the optional bug catcher on Route 3. You would normally skip this. And inside of Mount Moon, I do take on the Super Nerd. I take on the bug catcher found near him. I then go up and fight the Double Grass Slash. I fight the youngster that's near the ladder going down to Mega Punch. And then I take out the out of place and overpowered Raticate Trainer as well for some good experience the extra training here it takes me up to level 21 when i get done with the fossil super nerd and the goal was to just kind of alleviate the pressure of annoying fights when you ultimately head into cerulean and i don't see any reason any logical reason to attempt misty even if we do have sand attack so the choice here is to take on rival number two and we're gonna see a bird duel this is just kind of like the i'm you but better meme and like the old saying goes you either die a hero or you live long enough to be the sand attacker despite throwing sand into the enemy bird face it just it doesn't matter because you know that the AI will cheat if it needs to and I can't stress how annoying it is to still take two sand attacks here despite throwing sand attack first but we do get by even if we have some sand in our shoes it's okay the rest of the battle is honestly it's not as bad as you would think I really really do like it when you kind of shrug off the accuracy debuffs and just kind of get through it it feels like you're sticking a big middle finger to the AI for trying to pull these types of shenanigans but there's no resets here today we can just continue along after the fight I do heal and I didn't need to now you can chalk up behavior and little time losses like this just due to the nature of live streaming a game we'll clean it up later but if you've never tried to stream and juggle all the aspects of that while playing a game it's it's not as easy as you would think if you haven't done it now my friends we always talk about nugget bridge being very important but I keep it to the minimum today I don't have any trouble and I think we can skip ahead to misty now good speed is a huge benefit here and we have the damage to easily dispatch star you to quickly move on to the meat and potatoes of the fight and that's going to be starmy we always knew it would be and here i devolve i play like a total degenerate i set up the full complement of sand attacks i'm pretty much in full devil mode at this point and you would think at this point the chances of the starmy hitting you through six sand attacks is low and you just win this one by default right maybe look at this guys it it hits a bubble beam through six sand attacks and on top of that the little cherry on top is that it crits anyway this is specifically infuriating because gen one stage modifiers for accuracy accuracy are much more awful than the other games. Just a singular sand attack in Gen 1, it would put you at 66% of what the move should be, whereas later gens would make that 75%. And what I'm trying to say is that Starmie only had roughly a 25% chance to even hit the move and an even lower chance to crit if it hit that chance. Now, when I see things like this, all you can do is just kind of roll your eyes, maybe take a little, a slight chuckle, and just say that, hey, I love Pokemon. Now, let's go down to the SSN, and we're going to talk about perhaps the worst thing about Pidgeot, and it's the fact that it does not get Body Slam. It's a huge blow, and it definitely is going to impact how good this Pokemon can actually be, especially when you consider that we have to go against Surge without it. So, I head to the basement here, and I'm going to pick up a lot of extra battles. There's a handful of basic and easy battles we don't really have to go into and after I take out the gentleman to get to the optional rare candy that takes us to rival number three we're at a solid level 29 this fight can be summed up quickly I decide not to sand attack I don't give in to my little demon on my shoulder I go for straight damage I do take a sand attack in retaliation but the rest of the battle is not a hassle I make it through regardless what I would like to talk about is that this is a blind run I've said that multiple times but the extra training earlier was so that I can hit level 30 I figured that damage rounding number for surge would be the most helpful and that's going to be the key thing of this fight and without waiting anymore, let's just kind of take a look at Surge. Voltorb is first, I start off with a sand attack. Now the idea is that Sonic Boom doesn't have the best accuracy, so if it does go for it, it'll have a higher chance to miss. But it doesn't matter because I just crit here and we're all good. Now Pikachu does have a solid chance of going for Thunder Wave, which is not what you want to see. So with that in mind, I toss out some sand. It does cause a miss, and it really turns out not to matter here because the thing about blind runs, you just don't know anything, and it looks like you can just comfortably one-shot the Pikachu, so no need to even set up anything. Surge does have good AI in Pokemon Red, so it's going to go for Thunder shock or the very painful thunderbolt every single turn unless it goes for an x speed 
but Pidgeot, my friends, he has the power of sand on its side, and it's going to be the great equalizer here. I outspeed, sand attack, it misses, so I sand attack again, but it does hit that thunderbolt, and after another sand attack, it hits a thundershock, so we're getting low, but with some sand lined up, it's time to go on the offensive, and just like with Pikachu, it's kind of like a surprising two-shot here, so I probably actually wasted turns, but we'll see for the next run, but we do make it through. I also hit 31, we get access to wing attack. Flying does not have great moves in Gen 1, and wing attack and the HM for fly, they're virtually identical, with fly generally being accepted as better, just because it has those defensive capabilities of being invulnerable, but wing attack is good for now, it's going to speed some things up. On the next route, we get to see wing attack in action. There's plenty of grass and bug types that we'll see before rock tunnel, and it gives Pidgeot this tiny little bit of flexibility, and I would just like to call attention to the fact that Gust only being a normal move in Generation 1 is a travesty. I don't know if I brought that up before, I don't think I have, but having a 60 effective power move of each type at the start of the game with how many bugs and grass are found in the early game, it would make this run feel so much better, but let's not focus on the what ifs. Instead, let's take it straight into another really tough battle of the run. Pidgeot has one huge glaring weakness similar to Farfetch'd. Rock is going to be the kryptonite for this bird. And all you can really do here in this battle against a self-destruct hiker is sand attack and hope. Now it works out at the start, but let me just say that this battle, it feels pretty bad. I hate calling out questionable AI plays, but when I'm on stream, it's usually always at its worst. But we get a big beefer of a play, and you might be wondering why I would even say big beefer. It's the type of hot dog. I don't know. Don't question it. Anyway, the Geodude, it hits through the sand attack and it crits with its 5% crit rate to take me low. And the worst part here is it's not gonna be the last time in this video where we're gonna see that. Sometimes the computer just don't even see the accuracy. We're gonna see it right here immediately on the Graveler. It's gonna hit a rock throw despite having many sand attacks put on it. Guys, let me stress this before I blow a gasket. Rock throw, it's god awful. Its accuracy is bad. And when you add four sand attacks, I'm gonna calculate this up real quick for you guys. The accuracy, I checked the numbers here because I'm salty. It's 18.15% chance to hit. I actually, real quick, we need to move to the next clip because this is absurd. And you know what? I'm going to move to the next clip, but watching this back, going back through this run and looking at some other parts, it just, you just got to laugh at it, guys. Consistency and smart play, they always feel really good. But even if you get yourself in a position where the numbers are stacked in your favor, the AI just never ceases to amaze me with the links that it'll go to win a battle. It's not that serious, AI. You got to stop it. Now, I'm not going to go on a tangent. I'm not going to talk about things like the Agatha battle that I had recently on a Krabby stream but let me just wrap this one up and say that I just sand attack. I hope that they miss. And that, my friends, is what we like to call strategy. Now we've got just a little taste, a little nibble of how rock types are gonna be. And before we segue into what's gonna likely be another tangent, I'm gonna talk about a huge blunder. I have wing attack. I also have access to fly, and I should be taking on Erica right now. Now we just seen how awful the self-destruct hiker is, and I don't know why in my mind, but right now I'm just thinking, hmm, I guess I'll go take on other rock types immediately. And we're gonna see that it's a mistake. This leads me to something that I would like to talk about, and this run is gonna illustrate this perfect I can finally show some evidence. Pidgeot does not do well in the Rocket Hideout. Rule sets that allow you to skip this part of the game, it would make Pidgeot avoid a battle that's probably in its worst top five in the whole entire game. And essentially, this is why I like to keep it in to get a full feel of the Pokemon so that we can see the strengths and the weaknesses in full effect. Skipping the Hideout, it means that you always have to shop in the Celadon Mart at the same time for every run. And it kind of eliminates some additional nuance between the runs. For example, a lot of weaker runs just like to hold off on their one buy so that they can afford more vitamins. So needless to say, I don't like that aspect of the Pokedoc skip either. Now let me stress that everyone has their own rules. There is no right way to do these solo runs, but I really just wanted to clarify and articulate my thoughts since this is a, such a great example of why I do the Rocket Hideout. Outside of that, Pidgeot gets access to Double Edge. It's a 100 base power stab move. It's going to give us a massive nuke here. And I've talked about Double Edge a lot. I really have grown to like it, especially in recent runs, probably over like the last year or so. And I just, I personally think that a lot of people exaggerate the recoil damage. It's a really good move. Now, this is a blind run, so it's not going to be as tightly routed as it could be. 
but extra potions or some attention to detail it could pretty much all but nullify the drawbacks but we're gonna see that we're gonna see it put in a lot of work for this run i'm also grabbing the high money items the usual stuff i want to have a better shot by later but let's move on to giovanni and this one it was pretty rough The first Giovanni actually gets an intro today and in the first attempt, it's just straight plain garbage. Let me reiterate that Generation 1 Rock Throw has a base 65% accuracy. It's awful. A great mental image for you is that Rock Throw has slightly less accuracy of a 100% accurate move that's been hit by Sand Attack. A single Sand Attack reducing the accuracy to 66% means that Rock Throw would have a 42.9% chance to hit on just a single Sand Attack and it just keeps going down. Now we're going to get a very rare example here of a guard spec by Silphco actually being useful. What a world we live in. We meme about this a lot, but Giovanni using it means his Pokemon cannot have their stats lowered. So Sand Attack, it's all but useless, and it's hilarious on stream because I didn't even realize it, but the main point here is that evasion moves, they can just be really frustrating to use. It's inconsistent, and you can see that the Onyx is hitting multiple rock throws, even through the Sand Attack, so I just kind of throw in the towel on the first attempt. On the second attempt, I'm not even going to show all this. It pains me to even watch this back. This is all you need to know. I Sand Attack, it hits the 42% accurate rock throw. I Sand Attack again, it hits on the even less accurate rock throw, and then I Sand Attack again, and the computer has the unmitigated gall to hit a third rock throw. There's not much to say here other than that Giovanni could probably do a Weedle run or enter the lottery. He would win, no problem. Moving ahead, we know the strategy by now. We don't need to keep going over it. It's similar to the self-destruct hacker in the fact that Pidgeot, it just really can't handle rock tops and we have to kind of hide behind sand attack. But in this case, there's no self-destruct to kind of bail us out. You're going to see me fail here and it just comes down to bad luck. I do little damage and the computer hits too many moves and there's really no point in diving into this too much. Now we can just kind of skip ahead a couple attempts later because there's not really much to analyze. You can see that the Rhyhorn, it's slow and steady. It's a slog. I'm still missing 60% of my health going into the Kangaskhan and it's the cherry on top here. I'm able to get off a couple of sand attacks before the dreaded guard spec comes up once again and I have just enough health to chip it down, finish the battle with double edge, and finally we can move on with our lives. And as you can see, this one wasn't great. It definitely has a lot of room for improvement in the optimized run. But this is such a great example of why I don't skip the rocket hideout. Obviously taking on Erica was probably the correct move, but this is the reason for a blind run so you can just kind of move things around, you can improve. Now I'm going to make my second mistake here in the fact that I go shop before Erica. I can't really say why I was scared of her. Maybe I thought she would put me to sleep, maybe waste some time, but it's hard to say what I was feeling in this moment. But I do shop here. I pick up six proteins. I make sure to get the Poke Doll for Mimic later. Next up, I still don't do Erica for some reason. I go for Pokemon Tower instead. And the rival here is not bad since we have some levels and we have a pretty powerful fly for the Ghastly, so we don't have to talk much about this segment of the game either. Finally, I make my way down to the Celadon Gym. Better late than never. I don't do any extra training since I've already kind of invested a lot into that earlier in the game. And as for the gym battle, you're just going to see something incredibly easy. Big shocker. So easy that it led me to believe that going here very first was going to be the play. I've already kind of talked about that, but we'll see if that's what I decide when we get to the optimized run. After that, it's time for a very standard Safari Zone visit, and I make the decision to return to Celadon Mart because I thought Reflect might be useful coming up, and in the blind run, wasting a little time to test out different strategies never really hurts anything. Back down in Fuchsia, it's time to take on Koga. Now keep in mind, I don't know the ranges here, and it looks like a double edge cannot one-shot the Comfings, which means the AI gets a chance to poison me. Of course, it takes it, and now we're on the clock. From there, with poison and the information that our damage isn't quite good enough it leads to a situation where recoil damage and poison is just too much and I go down for a reset here on the next attempt I make an adjustment to use fly on the coughing since double edge just can't one shot it anyway and I still get poison on the muck go figure I'm able to navigate through the fight but by the time I make it to the wheezing I'm in the yellow health I'm poisoned but Pidgeot we still have a little trick up our sleeve and this leads to one of my favorite iterations that you're gonna see in a run if you use the invulnerable turn of like dig or fly or if you have the accuracy debuffing moves like sand attack i just love watching a self-destruct miss to give you a free win and even though this battle didn't feel great it's still a first turn victory nonetheless rather than trying to do something like blaine first i do go with a sylph visit next and outside of the 10th floor rare candy it is straight down to business with rival number five
It's a mirror match on the lead, and to tip the scales ever so slightly in my favor, I toss a little bit of sand. From there, two flies looks like a pretty comfortable two shot, and we are moving on without taking too much damage. Growlithe is next, and it's just Growlithe. It does its best, and I think we can all just appreciate that. Execute isn't really an issue with heavy flying damage, which is a positive because usually it's really annoying, but it does survive with the reflect, but all it accomplishes is wasting just a little more time. Now the big boys are at the end of the fight since we do outspeed the Alakazam, and I preserve some health up to this point. This battle is looking primed for a double edge sweep and that's exactly what I do. The Blastoise is tanky, it can survive one, but once again, first try victory on a blind run feels pretty positive in my book. Normally we'd skip over Sylph and we'd be done with it, but just like the Rocket Hideout Pidgeot, it has its own sets of challenges, and the next one, it's immediately after with Giovanni number two. This one doesn't get an intro just due to the fact that he pretty much ditched most of his rock types. He leads with a Nidorino, then he brings in a Kangaskhan. They don't have the best moves in the world, and even though I do take some damage, I'm able to get through those easy enough. Now, Rhyhorn is where those resistances and limited move pool come back into play. I'm low enough to where I don't want to take any more recoil damage, so I throw out some sand attacks and we start to quick attack. We slowly get the job done, but at this point, I'm deep into the yellow health and there's a Nidal Queen left in the back. The problem here is that I'm just too low, but I would like to point out that ground Pokemon are not a bad matchup. It's specifically the rock typing that's bad here, but ground doesn't resist normal, it doesn't resist flying, so despite losing here, I'm fairly confident about the next time. And you can see I make it back to the Rhyhorn, I'm much healthier, I still take some damage here and there, but I met nearly double the health going into the Nidal Queen, and that was all I needed. I still play it cautiously, I set up some sand attacks, and this one wasn't clean, but only one reset isn't something I can really complain about about too much in the grand scheme of things. Now let's relax a little bit. We can take a really, really brisk swim down to Cinnabar. And after some intrusive thoughts about if TM28 is actually Tombstoner, brother, or not, I don't waste any more time. I go straight to Blaine. I think about this one for a second, and I decide just to go ahead and set up agility for some badge boost for a safer play. My experience, it was luckily just set up at a number to where I don't actually level up during the fight. So I just start to let Fly loose. And even though this one isn't clean, Fly does its job on the first three Pokemon and double edge. It fulfills its role as the closer and I take down Arcanine and we get another badge Let's swiftly keep it rolling straight into Sabrina and I just don't care in this fight I throw caution to the wind and I just go straight double edge with no regard for Pidgeot's life And it just kind of works out. I saved Sabrina for last because I was kind of worried But it turns out she's much easier than anticipated. She has frail Pokemon. I should have known Moving on to the last gem, I did pick up Mimic earlier, and now's the time to use it. It's a great help for several fights, including Giovanni, even if the red and blue version isn't as scary as yellow version, but let's kind of dive in if you haven't seen this strategy before. We start out with Rhyhorn. It's more or less the kind of battle where I'm just going to slowly chip it down. I know I'm going to level up, so I don't bother with any setups, and when it's finally out of the way, we can get on to one of my, honestly, one of my favorite strategies in the game. Dugtrio has Dig, and that's going to be our Mimic target. I do take a Sand Attack for my troubles, but what can you really do? You can't really avoid that. And from there, I take it out because I'll level up right after going into that final half of the fight. Now, this is my opportunity to set up with the badge boost. We can get a little bit of extra attack, and then we're going to go on a tear with Dig. Now, right on at the very end is still absurdly physically bulky, but with no rock slide in red and blue, the outcome is pretty much inevitable, and that's all eight badges down. Let's take it straight into rival number six, and with over 7,000 experience to go to the next level up, I just, I simply don't know if I'm gonna level up, so I opt to go straight damage and move on. Next is Rhyhorn, and it was about at this point in the run when I figured out that straight double edge does pretty decent damage. We'll see if that comes back into play. I take some recoil, but it really wasn't that slow, and that's the main thing to take note of here. Growlithe is next, and that's enough screen time for Growlithe. Let's just get it out of here. Let's move on. Execute cannot take a super effective fly. It goes down. Alakazam also goes down to a single double edge. And at the end of the fight, Blastoise is there. And it turns out I actually could have set up here. And after the double edge doesn't do half of its health, I do swap over to Fly. It lets me avoid a Skull Bash. And I hang on and we get a victory here. Now my friends, the elite challenges are all that's left, and this is another part of the run that I kind of guessed at it, and I got it right. 
I have all of my rare candies, all 11, but I knew Lorelai was gonna be a potential challenge, probably the biggest challenge of the run. So my guess was to try around level 63. That'd be a great place to start. So I do pick up the rare candy in Victory Road, and I pick up six optional battles inside of Victory Road to get up to level 52. And from there, I do give Lorelai a little cheeky attempt. We don't have to see. It failed horribly. So I use all 11 of my rare candies. We get to level 63. And the only thing left to do is kind of look at the Elite Four, see how Pidgeot does. Dugong is up first, and the goal here is that maybe Fly can bypass the first turn, and then maybe she'll waste the second turn on rest. What happens here is that I crit, it forces a retroactive super potion, and I just finish it off with double edge right after. On Cloyster, I think a little bit about what to do, but I decide Fly is probably better here. It doesn't quite do half, I take some damage, and on the second Fly, the 17.5% crit rate comes into play, and I get past pretty much the hardest part of the fight. Now essentially this fight is going to be over. I can mimic amnesia from Slowbro, I can boost my stats, but more importantly I can also boost my special to extreme levels so we can survive any super effective damage. Now I also set up agility here just for good measure and I'm pretty much ridiculously overpowered when I reach that stage and there's not really much lore I can do. Now I make short work of her remaining Pokemon and it, the hardest challenge of the battles down on the very first try, but trust me guys we'll talk about this more later. This one was pretty lucky. Bruno is next and if you aren't familiar you might think this fight is hard now i think j rose a long time ago did a zapdos run and over the last couple of years comments never let me forget that this fight was just so tough for flying types now all you have to do is kind of grit your way through the first onyx it's really not that bad onyx is an awful pokemon i set up just to do a little bit more damage and i essentially i just ignore it on hitmonchan it's simple you just take ice punch and since you have super effective damage for the rest of his team it's going to be an easy sweep we don't even have to spend any more time talking about bruno it's that easy. Let's take a look at Agatha and I didn't know my damage here just like all the fights I guess as a blind run. I went straight fly and it's just not enough but it does get it low enough to trigger a retroactive potion. I take it out in the next turn and on the goal bat I contemplate for a minute then I go for double edge. Sadly it just misses the range here but it's another retroactive potion. My favorite kind of situation we can move on. On the haunter it doesn't have the stats so I'm assuming that this will be a clean one shot but I do miss. I take some damage and finally this is the first Pokemon in the fight that I can actually one shot naturally. So on the Arbok comes in, we see the theme continue. A double edge just can't knock it out. And for our troubles, we get glared. So I'm paralyzed here. That means it goes first. I take more damage from an acid and we're kind of moving on to the end. We're hobbling. We're deep in the red hell. This one's not looking good. And this is where everything just kind of catches up to me. I get confused. I hurt myself. I skip a turn due to paralysis. And we end up having our first reset of the Elite Four, but we know some things to change up for next time. At least you would think so. It seems obvious maybe just to set up one or two agilities to put all those ranges into play a little bit better, but I just kind of repeat the first attempt strategy, and despite not one hitting most things, I dominate here. And maybe there is a better way to do this fight, but you really can't argue with the results here. Next up is Papa Lance, and there's one thing I want to do. I want to mimic that sweet and juicy Hyper Beam, but unfortunately the cost is that I take a Hyper Beam crit straight to the face. It takes me deep into the yellow health. Now since it does need to recharge, I do set up once, and I play it cautious here. I go for Fly because I don't think Hyper Beam will one-shot. I get a fortunate miss on Hydro Pump, and two Flies do take it out. Now to have a chance here, I know I'm going to need to set up some more. Dragon Rage is the worst case scenario, and it happens immediately. Now I'm at less than 40 health so it means I have to kind of pull the trigger with only two boosts so I let loose the hyper beam it is a one shot which means the next Dragonair should be as well and it is Aerodactyl is next it resists normal moves but I'd have to test this damage out for science it does some really heavy damage but it's just not enough and to make this one as painful as it can possibly be I get confused and I hit myself twice to take another reset now I know the resets they're messed up in the footage it is what it is just ignore it on the next attempt things start off better I take only 40 points of health via a dragon rage I take hyper beam and now I kind of want to set up but the AI decides that it wants to run it back and it gets yet another hyper beam crit it takes me extremely low now at this point I know it's time for yellow strat so I just I completely set up just hoping the computer doesn't do much and I actually I can get the full setup here and I get an extra boost from a leer this means I have two additional boost overall than I did last time Lance and I stare each other in the eyes we both go for a hyper beam and in an odd coincidence we both miss and on the next turn I fire off the boosted hyper beam we take it out now at this point we're low but we still have a shot we already know that the two dragonairs are 
an easy one shot from last time so we don't have to talk about them too much. And Aerodactyl, that's really what matters. Will two boosts make the difference? The answer here is maybe, but I just crit so we don't know. I take it out. And that means Dragonite's at the end. And in the Battle of the Beams, Pidgeot has proved that it's the best flyer in this fight with one last one shot. And that means we're down to the final battle of the game. Once again, it's another bird duel mirror match. I have a huge advantage here, but I do just want to set up agility fully. Just get that out of the way. Now what happens here is that this one drags on a little bit too long, but when it's all said and done, I don't take hardly any damage. I'm set up and we can kind of look at the rest of the fight. Alakazam, normally a huge terror, but we have high speed and we can just kind of trivialize this little spoon cat man and we can just keep pushing ahead. Right on in the rock tops, they started as this really big obstacle, but in this stage of the run, I just consistently chip at it and although we do take some damage in return right on it's just not a huge threat in red and blue that means we're left with a thick puppy but flailing our body like a double-edged sword does get the job done and next up is everyone's favorite coconut tree now flying damage it goes without saying that it's great here and after hearing that very satisfying crunch and some coconuts hit the floor we're looking at the end of the battle I let a fly loose and it does half damage so it looks like this one's over but this little dirty cheating AI has other plans he ends enters the Billy Mitchell code and he gets a crit on the blizzard and just like that Pidgeot suffers a deep reset. Pretty painful. On the next attempt, I make one small adjustment. On the Alakazam, I take recover just to ensure the victory so that I can heal up and the rest of the fight plays out the same, if not better. And this time the extra health means that I can double edge the blast toys and without his precious little crits, the champion can't do anything but watch Pidgeot break the blast toys in half with a run ending double edge. And that's the blind run over for Pidgeot. 12 resets with a time of three hours and 40 minutes. It might seem decent to some people, but it's really not. It would be around things like Rattata or Scyther in the upper D tier, but we do have a lot of work to do. And let me quickly say that I recorded this whole part before I even did the optimized stuff. So at this point in talking, I have no idea how much it's gonna improve, but don't go anywhere. I'm hoping we can save an hour. That'd be ideal. Let's try something different here. I'm gonna rapid fire through some of the optimizations and I'm gonna be transparent up front. I did have to do extra runs with Pidgeot because my spreadsheets that I used for ranges, it was messed up. Fly had an erroneous power. It led me to believe that I was stronger than I actually was. We'll get to that later. Now, optimizations, they start up front. Knowing that I'm gonna be short of level 13, I do grind a little bit before and that means that I can hit the levels I need before Brock without needing to backtrack. It's already a big time save. Now the fight's roughly the same. We've already seen it. And from there, I do roughly the same Mount Moon as Last time, I do hit level 21 on the Cerulean Rival. It makes things feel pretty consistent. I didn't see any reason to change it. Past Nugget Bridge, I do take on the single Onyx Hiker rather than the Elixir Hiker because Geodude knows Defense Curl, but either way you go, it's still going to be a little bit slow. There's not much you can do about it. I still fight Misty at level 25, but the next thing is down on the SSN. I just, I simply cut out all the optional battles. It saves a pretty significant amount of time and it leads me to a level 28 surge fight. Now, just due to the random nature of Sand Attack, I suffer my first reset of the run here, but it it was pretty close and on the next attempt it does look kind of bad but I just shrug off the paralysis due to quick attack we'll talk about that more and I want to talk about something that was really useful for this run in regards to that now you're not going to see it here in this footage but I don't have wing attack so I am open to that para wrap strategy that the junior trainer is famous for but since quick attack is a priority move you can essentially just ignore the cut speed from paralysis you can just go first anyway and it really gave me a lot of confidence to route this run and I definitely thought I should mention it next is the dreaded self-destruct hiker and you know that this is a sand attack and hope kind of fight and honestly the levels didn't matter much so I didn't care to cut them you just kind of got to hope that the lower chance to hit goes in your favor and it does here now keep in mind that in the blind run we were still in the basement of the SSN at this point in time so we're already saving a ton of minutes when it comes to this run now we can start to go through some big changes I've already hinted at this but just do Erica first you're a flying type not only that you can skip the tedious battles early and it means you have a little extra time where you can just kind of power train on Erica goons for some easy experience and you can take her out as well and I can't believe that I didn't recognize this on my first playthrough but that's why it's kind of stupid to judge a Pokemon based on a single blind run in my opinion because bad routing will make a Pokemon look much worse than it is it really says more about you being a bad player than it does
says about the Pokemon being bad, but I digress. This pays immediate dividends. We're gonna see it right here on Giovanni. I don't even use Sand Attack, that's all you need to know. I go straight double edge, I have the stats to survive, and the recoil isn't too bad. It really speeds up this battle a lot from the blind run. And when we're watching this, honestly, it's why I love repeated runs and the route tweaking and all that kind of stuff. It's what keeps me coming back to the hobby. Now the game is really lax from there. There's very minor tweaks. Let's jump ahead to the next change. I opt to get an early surf user before Koga. We get the good rod and we go fishing right behind his house. That's very important to make this the fastest thing. It's going to open up an alternate path. And I just want to go ahead and show another funny interaction with Koga. I don't really even play the game. I just get to wheezing and I just sand attack until it just gets tired of it and offs itself. But this leads to a much earlier Cinnabar visit. And I decided to do this because Red and Blue Blaine is just, it's not that good of a fight. It's pretty funny most of the time. But it is really high level and the extra experience it really helps to smooth out the rest of the game, which was already fairly easy in the blind run anyway, so I don't see any reason to go into detail on those battles, but just know that there wasn't any extra training. I don't have any additional resets, despite getting fairly low, as you'll see at the end clips of these little bits of footage that I'm showing. Going towards the Elite Four, I have a more precise range and knowledge on the trainers I need to fight. That means I get to a quicker level 52. I use all 11 rare candies, and I fight Lorelei at level 63, just like last time. And do you guys remember when I said I got lucky on Lorelei. Well, there was something that came up for two additional resets here in the optimized run, and it was the attack debuff. Aurora Beam has a 33% chance at lowering your attack, and in this run, it's a death sentence. The Dugong hits it on the very first attack that lands on me, and try as I might, you just cannot do enough damage needed to get by, so it's a reset. Now, on the next attempt, I make it through the toughest part of the fight, so it's all good, but no, you'd be wrong. The Slowbro starts off with two consecutive growls, and by the time it's done with me, I'm at negative six on my attack and I have a grand total of 42 in my attack stat and it's just funny maybe it's just pathetic how little damage I was doing here this could have gone a lot worse but two resets really not that bad considering I came into the fight with just one the next small stroke of bad luck comes on Lance I get chipped down low on Gyarados and Aerodactyl he hangs on and that allows it to deliver a lethal takedown for the next reset and on the very next attempt I'm skittish I don't know if I have the ranges on Aerodactyl so I go for fly but it just goes for hyper beam it crits and the flying fossil that's the last reset for this run on the champion I return to that recover strat from Mimic for added consistency. I weave through the fight and we finally finish off the optimized run pretty strong. Pidgeot's final time is 2 hours, 45 minutes, and 28 seconds and just from the eyeball test you can tell that it's not up there with Farfetch but it came a lot closer than I thought it would. Pidgeot's time and resets equate to an 86.38 rating, putting it about 2.5 points behind the Swords Dancing Bird and I'm not really that surprised. Now if you want to know the exact details of the formula that I'm using to get these rankings out of 100 there is a video in the description and if we take a look at the tier list Pidgeot is ahead of Slowpoke's 85.76 score and it's a mere five thousandths behind Kangaskhan these two are extremely close now when some of you said that I should round closer and not go two places this is the reason why you don't do that I need to be accurate it's important to me and at the end of the day love you guys appreciate you watching but this is for my enjoyment too but overall very solid run I think if you could have found a way to do Lorelei at an earlier level, perhaps this could have been greater, but the flying topping, it's always a detriment. And remember when I said that I erroneously had fly at a higher power, I thought I could do this run at level 60 going into Lorelei, and I was devastated when I found out that the spreadsheets and numbers were just wrong, so it is what it is. If you guys like the format of a blind run first, you have to let me know because it's something I do sparingly just because it takes so much extra time. And unless this video gets like double or triple the views, it's not going to be a regular thing. Now, as always, if you are listening to this right now, you're a real one. You should comment that down below. And I'd like to personally thank all my channel members and Patreons. The support means a lot. And that's about it for me. We're going to keep it short and sweet. And I'll catch you guys on the next one. Bye.